as you are sitting in your chairs, the estimate is that there are 40 million sensory inputs going into your brain every second. 40 million sensory inputs going into your brain every second. <coughs> but only 40 of those are you consciously aware of. 40 million sensory inputs coming from your eyes, your ears, uh, all the nerve endings on your skin, your sense of smell, every second, but only 40 are you consciously aware of. So what is going on with the other 39,999,060? I think that calculation is right. Well, it turns out that all of that processing is going on in your unconscious part of your brain. I have a PhD in psychology and for um, way too long, like over 30 years, which amazes me for sure, I have been applying what we know about psychology, how people think and learn and work, to the design of technology. And since I said it was over 30 years, then obviously I go back pre-web. In fact, our, our speaker who was showing the card reader I was afraid he was going to ask, and how many of you, you know, used to do the key punch cards, and I would have had to raise my hand, and that would have been very embarrassing. Right? <laughs> so I've been applying what we know about psychology to the design of technology. But what I became really interested in in the last five years is not what we know about the conscious mind, which is what my background is in, has been in for most of the time, but all the in, in, fascinating new research about what we know about unconscious mental processing, which is kind of a paradox, right, that we would know anything about unconscious mental processing since it's unconscious. And so the reality is that most of what we do every day, all day long, most of the decisions we make, most of the actions we take, is actually all coming from our unconscious mind and we're not even aware of it. And that's what I want to talk about today, is what do we know about the unconscious mind and how does that impact web design? So one of the things about me, I think it's because I have a PhD in psychology, and so I had to do all that horrible, silly research in grad school. I actually, um, I, I try, so every now and then I try and remember the title of my dissertation just so it doesn't you know, go into obscurity forever. And I think it was something like cross-modal comparisons of uh, cerebral laterality. I was studying the left half and the right half of the brain. Some little esoteric thing. But I love research, and I read a lot of research. And so I'm going to share with you uh, some of the research. Some of this is really new, and some of it goes back for a while. This first set of research I want to share is by a researcher called John Barg, B-A-R-G-H. And what he did was, he ran a whole series of experiments. He would give people these uh, scrambled sentences, and, and they, were, they were five words long, and you had to take four of the words, you could eliminate one word, and make a sentence that was grammatically correct. So I might eliminate um, the word she and say, yesterday he was aggressive, right? And, they would, and, it, and he would give them a whole sheet of these things to do. Well, he had three groups, okay? And group A, he would give them words that had a, aggressive and rude and interrupt and hostile, words like that in the sentences. And group B had words like this that had respect and kind and helpful. And group C had neutral words. They were not rude and they were not uh, nice, neither one. And then what he would do, he'd give people these sentences, they'd be in one group or another, they would unscramble the sentences, and he would say to them, when you're all done unscrambling, I want you to uh, walk down the hall and find me and I'll tell you what we're going to do next. Okay? Well, the real part of the experiment was that they would walk down the hall and when they found him, he would be standing with his back to them. And he'd be pretending to talk, he'd be talking to someone else. This was all part of the experiment. And he really wanted to see how long would it take for them to interrupt him. Right? And his theory was that if you had been unscrambling rude words, you would interrupt a lot faster than if you were unscrambling nice words, and that the neutral words would be in between, and he was absolutely correct. 
that's what happened. He even did a whole other version where he used words about people being old and tired versus words about being youthful and full of energy. And then he would time how long it took them to walk down the hall. And the people that had the old and tired would kind of walk down the hall more slowly, right? So they were, people were being very influenced by things, by these words. This is what we call framing or anchoring. What was even more interesting, I think, is that when he would talk to people about the results, the people who were in the study, and he would say, are you aware that you walked a little more slowly down the hall? Then you know, they would go, oh, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. So we are very influenced by things around us, and we do not realize how much of this processing is unconscious. So uh, this is what my book is about. And in my book, I talk about uh, the brain. And I, I, it's really overly simplified. And if there are any of you who are um, you know, psychology majors who studied the brain, um, this is really oversimplified. But basically, I talk about, about the brain. But there are really three brains, not one. We have the new brain, the midbrain, and the old brain. So the new brain, that's where all, and I'm pointing to my forehead because that's actually literally where it is. And that's where all your conscious processing goes on. And this is, I mean, you know, that it's, it's your new brain that's listening to what I'm saying and thinking about it. And we tend to do a lot of work there. We tend to design websites for that part of the brain because it's the part of the brain we're most familiar with. But we have these other two brains that are equally or even more important. That's where a lot of the unconscious processing is going on. So the midbrain, or, or the emotional brain, um, is the part of the brain that processes emotional information. Uh, it, it processes pictures and stories and people's faces. And the old part of the brain, and it's called old because it, it, it goes back the furthest in terms of evolutionary development. The old part of the brain is interested in survival. So the old part of the brain is constantly scanning the environment and saying, uh, can I eat it? Can I have sex with it? Will it kill me? Okay, That's all the old brain cares about. It's just looking, making sure that you're OK. So the interesting thing is that if you're going to design a website that is usable and persuasive and engaging and will, will get people to take the action you are hoping they will take, you have to talk to all three brains. You can't just talk to one, because we, everything we do involves all, th all three brains. Now sometimes people say, oh, isn't it horrible that we're so irrational? You know, the book, uh, Dan Ariely is predictably irrational. No, it's not irrational. It's not irrational. Or this, you know, now that you know that you're making decisions in this irrational, unconscious way, you can, you can change that. No, you can't. That's like, OK. Uh, isn't it terrible we only have two eyes? You know, flies have hundreds of eyes or something like that. And if we had more eyes, just think of all the things we can do. So just work on having more eyes, you know? It's like, okay, it's not going to happen, right? We're, we're not irrational. This is adaptive. Think about if you had to go, if you had to drive down the street for a mile and pay attention to each 40 million of the sensory inputs every second. I mean, you wouldn't make it, you know, 10 feet before you would kill yourself in the car, right? It's very adaptive. This is what humans do. So what does this mean if we're going to talk about designing websites? Well, I want to talk about um, more research and, and start to focus in now on how this applies to websites. So uh, one of the things that humans do is they like to have a lot of choices. This is because they want to have a lot of control. And the reason they want to have a lot of control is because their old brain is telling them, if you can control the environment, you can get more you know, sex food and you won't die. So control means choice. So we want a lot of choices, right? We love a lot of choices. But the research is very clear that when we have a lot of choices, we don't choose anything. OK, we just don't choose. Because it's overwhelming, and we can't deal with it, and we don't know what to do. So a very uh, famous study by Sheena Iyengar, who has a brand new book out. I haven't even gotten a third of the way through. It came out about a month ago. Uh, it's called The Art of Choosing. Um, one of, and it looks like it's really good from the start of it. And she did a study that's now called the JAM study. <clears throat> so they, they set up a, a table in a grocery store, and they had uh, different jars of jam that people could come and try. And sometimes the table had 24 jars of jam, different flavors. And sometimes the table had six jars of jam. 
And the question is, which table did people stop at and, and, try, and actually try more jam? The table that had 24 or the table that had six? How many people think that more people stopped if there were 24 people? I mean, 24 jam, jars of jam. Okay, and how many people think that more people stopped when there were six? Okay, actually, it's the 24. Aha, uh -huh. trick question, I'm sorry. Um, there was even a gasp over here, I love that. <gasps> no. Okay, so the table that had 24 jars of jam, more people stopped at that table. They would come by and try the jam. Ah, but here's the trick question part. Which table sold more jars of jam? Ah, right, right. So the table that had 24 jars, people stopped and tried it, but not that many people bought. So if we assume there were 100 uh, people coming by, and there are actually more than 100 in the study, but look at the numbers, right? They actually sold a lot more jam, less people stopped, but more people bought. Right? So we always think that more is better. And in fact, if you ask people, you know, what do you want to see at the website? Oh, I want more, I want more, give me more choices, right? But if there are too many choices, then we know that people won't, won't choose anything. Here's another interesting thing about choice. A um, man named Felfernig did a study uh, about tents, people buying tents online, and he wanted to know, you know, how many attributes should we show? You know, because there are tents, you can talk about how many people will sleep in the tent and how many people, uh, you know, are there windows in the tent and how big is the tent. And he was, you know, if we show two attributes, is that better than showing four? And he actually had a really weird finding turn up, which is the most important thing was that it was the first tent on the page. <laughs> that people, you know, they would get kind of overwhelmed and they would just choose the first one. Right. Uh, he wasn't even studying that, but that's what came out in the study. Again, we think people are making these decisions rationally, they're not. Uh, social validation is a principle that's talked a lot about in, in this kind of area of psychology. Uh, and the idea is that when we are uncertain of what to do, we look to other people to, for a clue, especially when we're uncertain. So Latane and Darley, and this research goes all the way back to 1968. I love it when people go, don't you have anything more <coughs> recent? You know. Well, it was good research, you know, and it's been proven over and over, so, you know, why not talk about it? Uh, interestingly, technology changes a lot and people actually don't, because this is all hardwired into our brain. Evolution is like on millions of years, okay? It's not on decades, so uh, the technology changes, but we actually don't. But what they did was they would stage these situations in city streets, and they would take an actor, and they'd have him dress, and, and they'd make, they would make it ambiguous. You didn't know what was wrong with him. And he would, he kind of, you know, I mean, he didn't, he, he kind of looked, he wasn't dressed really nice, he wasn't dressed in rags, it was kind of in between. And they'd have him like, like leaning over and he'd be groaning. Uh, uh, uh. Obviously there's something wrong, but you don't know what it is. Has he been drinking too much? Is he crazy? Is he dangerous? Is he sick? Is he just like a, a normal guy, he's having a heart attack? And then they would have people come by and then they would see what, who would help him. And what they found was that when they had one bystander come upon, uh, upon this person, they would help him 85% of the time. But if there were more people there, they wouldn't help as much. And the reason is they'd come by and they, I don't know, is he hurt? And they would look to see, you know, are you, and the other people are like, he's not doing anything. And he's like, I guess I'm not going to do anything either. Okay? <laughs> When we are uncertain, we looked at how, how does this play out in, at websites? Validation. What do you think about at websites? How do you see this principle of social validation? Right. Recommendations and reviews and ratings, right? It's amazing. We will listen to total strangers, right? And if you ask people, do you listen to the... No, 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 not really. I mean, I, you know, I'll check it out, but it doesn't really influence me that much. It does, it definitely influences, uh, influences people. This is a study um, by Chen where he compared um, which influenced people more. If the website said uh, other people you know, who, bought, who, who bought books like you, you know, bought this book, was that more influential than an expert you know, who wrote travel books saying, oh, this is the best travel book, or peers, other people that you don't know, but other just people like you. And it was the peers that were the, the most influential. All of those were influential but the peers were the most. We are very influenced by what other people do and say, and the more details 
that you give um, about the ratings, the more powerful they are. E-bags, yeah, they even have little personas. Oh yes, I use this bag, uh, I'm a business traveler, and little stories, and that makes it even more powerful. Let's talk about uh, scarcity, <coughs> right? So, you know, you could say, what is wrong with Apple? You know, the first time the iPhone came out, they didn't even make enough, for goodness sakes. Well, I suspect they did it on purpose, right? Because it was scarce, and that whatever is scarce is perceived as being more valuable. That, again, is the old brain speaking. The old brain doesn't want to lose anything, doesn't want to lose that opportunity. Everybody else likes this. I'm going to like it, too. Uh, the famous chocolate chip cookie study, which <clears throat> I talked about this a year ago at a conference, and... And they told me at another conference, they actually ran the study in the exhibition hall at the conference. They had two jars of cookies. So this is how the study originally went. You have jars of cookies, and in one jar there's a whole bunch of cookies, and in the other jar there's just a few cookies. And then you have people come and taste the cookies and tell, and they, they tell you which cookie they, do they vote as being the best cookie. Well, the cookies are identical, <laughs> but if they taste the cookie in the jar that doesn't have very many cookies anymore, then that cookie is much superior, right? And the idea being that everybody must have liked that cookie and they ate them all up and therefore they taste better, right? Something that is scarce is valuable, hence only one left, right? Or, you, you know, if you gotta purchase before 30 days is up. So these things are very, very powerful. And it all has to do with that idea of fear of loss. <clears throat> this is one of my absolutely favorite studies by Becquera, and um, bear with me, it, it's a little complicated, but, um, and I know, and it's, you know, late on a Friday, wow, and I'm going to make you guys think hard, but he would give people decks of cards, and you have a red deck of cards and a blue deck, and you would turn the card over, and when you turn the card over, um, he, the, the experimenter would either give you some money or take some money away, this was all pretend money, and and, and you didn't know the rules, you know, you had these two days, you could choose, I, I'm going to turn a card over from the red deck, or I'm going to turn a card over from the blue deck, and then they'd give you some money and take some away, and they'd just have you keep, you know, they'd go keep going, keep turning the cards over, and they would stop periodically and say, do you prefer the red deck or the blue deck, and you would give your answer. Well, here are what the rules were, but, you know, they, you didn't know it if you were doing the, the experiment, but the true rules were that if you took cards from the red deck, you wouldn't get very much money, but when they took money away, they wouldn't take away too much, right? If you used cards from the blue deck, you'd get more money, but when they took money away, they would take more money back. So you'd end up with more money if, in the long run if you used the red deck, but you don't know that, right? So they have them turning over the cards and the experimenters giving the money, and they say, stop and say, do you prefer one or another? And eventually, around you know, turn 30 or 40, people start to say, I, I prefer the red deck. And then they say, why do you prefer the red deck? And usually they would go, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think I prefer the red deck. And then they'd keep asking. And usually then around turn 70, they did this for 100 turns. Around turn 70, they, most people would say, I prefer the red deck, and here's why. And they could explain it. You know, I don't get as much money, but I don't lose as much, and so I think I'm going to make more money with the red deck. At the end, there was still like about... Uh, 30 per, no, I think it was 15% of the people that uh, preferred the red deck and did, still did, never had a blue eye. You know, I don't know, I just, but that's not even the interesting part of the study. What's interesting was they had these people hooked up to galvanic skin response, which measures minute amounts of sweat, which measure, measures stress and arousal. And their galvanic skin response reading was peaking at turn 10, okay? When they would eat, it got to the point where if they moved towards that blue deck, which is the dangerous deck where you're going to lose money, when people even started towards the blue deck, they'd get a spike in their, their bodies knew. Their unconscious mind had figured it all out, and it took like another 30 or 40 turns for the conscious mind to get it, okay? And that's very typical. Of, of the conscious and the unconscious mind. You're walking through the woods and you see a stick and your unconscious mind sees the stick and goes, is that a snake? And sends an alert and you jump back and your conscious mind doesn't even realize you've jumped back. And then you look down and you go, oh, 
it's a twig, and then you're fine, but it takes, you know, and that's what our unconscious mind does because it keeps us safe. So what this means, this fear of loss, we, we, are, we have an inbred fear of losing. We will make decisions so as not to lose something that is more important than the possibility of gain. So Barry Schwartz in The Paradox of Choice um, talks about experiments with selling cars. So <clears throat> I can sell you the car, I can say, here's the car, here's the entire price of the car, uh, the base price, okay? And then you have all these add-ons. You can add on, you know, the fancy wheels and the nice radio and all of that. Or sometimes they'll stay in the other side of the experiment. They would uh, give the car with, with everything built in. And if the person said, oh, that's too expensive, they'd say, oh, well, then decide which of the options you want to take out. Okay? Which way did people spend more money? when they gave them the base price and then they had the people add the options, or when they gave them the price that included everything and people had to take away the options. And I know um, you guys are now afraid to vote because you think it's a trick question, right? <laughs> so how many people think that people would spend more money when you had the base price and you added in the options? And how many people think that you'd spend more money when they had the whole thing and they would take it out? And it is that latter. Because People were thinking about the whole car and all the fancy options, and they don't want to lose anything, right? People don't want, the fear of loss is very, very motivating. I want to talk for a minute, um, I've been talking a lot about the old brain. And I want to talk for a minute about the midbrain, the emotional brain. And this is the part of the brain that is really sensitive to stories, and there's some really great research done about about stories and uh, storytelling. And here's a website, um, you know, my name is Zach and this is my story. Uh, my identity was stolen when I was seven, but I didn't find out until 10 years later, etc. I mean, this is, this is going to ha have, it has compelling messages. It has a photo that's going to talk to the midbrain. It has a photo of a person. Uh, it has a photo of a fairly attractive guy that's going to be that's going to be important. Um, it says, this is my story. So, and, and whenever we heard the word story, we all perk up. And then something was stolen. His identity was stolen. You know, danger, danger, danger. Right? So you've got you know, the midbrain and you've got the old brain. It, it makes it, uh, it's going to grab uh, at least the mid and old part of the brain. I'm going to read you a short story here. This is Manish. Uh, he's been hailed the luckiest teenager in India after he survived being skewered by a metal pole in a bus crash. The 18-year-old student was riding in a bus in Andhra Pradesh state when it was hit by a lorry. The force of the smash rammed the four-foot safety rail into his forehead and through his skull, only missing his spine by a few millimeters. He said, it struck my head and embedded me into the seat. I was stuck there crying, help me, as loud as I could. He had to slide his head up the pole before he could be cut free from the wreckage, but they still could not remove the pole from his brain. After an hour's painful journey on a rickshaw to the nearest hospital, the doctors told him there was nothing they could do. Finally, after a further three-hour ambulance ride to Bangalore, he underwent an emergency operation to remove the pole from his head. The surgeon said, the first thing he said to me was, get this bloody thing out of my head. It's remarkable. It missed every vital part of his brain. Now, the research tells us that while I was telling you that story, there was something very interesting going on in your brain. There are, are two parts of your brain, two different parts of your brain, that are active when it comes to pain. Okay? I call them the objective part and the subjective part. Um, that's not really what they are, but that, that's what I call them. So if I have, and I don't have like any sharp object here, um, pretend I have a pen or something. Uh, oh, look, he's going to give me a sharp object. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to hurt myself. No, okay. Um, so if I take this pen and I jab it really hard into my hand, which I'm not going to do, um, but if I did that, there would be one part of my brain that would light up and say, uh-oh, uh-oh, pain in hand, pain in hand. There's a problem, pain in hand. And it would... It would identify what part of the body the pain is in, 
right? And, and some indication of severity, right? But there, so that's the objective part. There is a problem with the hand. The subjective part would be deciding how bad is this really, okay? Is this so, you know, can I live with this until I'm done with the talk? Or do I need to go running out of the room screaming, you know, and get me help, get me help, right? That's the subjective part. Well, what's interesting is the research tells us that when I was reading you the story about Manish, your subjective part of your brain was lighting up the same as if this, this, what happened in the story was happening to you. Now, the objective part of the brain was not lighting up. You were very aware that you did not have a pole going through your head. Okay? But the subjective part was, and this is believed to be the, the subjective part of the brain that lights up. They're actually calling this now the seat of empathy in the brain because they believe this is what allows us to, you know, when you say to someone, um, and I don't know if, if, if we have so many languages here, whether this phrase is common in other languages, but in, in English we say, I feel your pain, right? I mean, <laughs> because in a way I actually do, you know, in that part of my brain. But this is what makes us, one of the reasons why stories are so powerful, so powerful. And, and, it, it, and in fact, everything, you know, stories are so natural to us that we don't even realize how important they are. Right? Think about all the conversations you have with everybody during the day. You know, if I say, you know, <clears throat> Donna, uh, what did you do after dinner last night? And she goes, oh, well, you wouldn't believe it. But, you know, Justin and I went out drinking. I, it's probably true, right? I don't know. All right. And it's going to be it's going to be a story. You know, it's just Twitter a kind of Twitter moment. Twitter moment, Twitter moment. But, we, are, you know, it's not as though she is going to stand there and say, uh, and just read off a bit, bunch of facts, you know. 1.15 a.m. left restaurant. You know, it's not going to be, it's going to be a story. That's how we communicate. And it amazes me sometimes that then we design websites, uh, and where's the story? You know, you go to the home page. Is there a story of any kind? No, there's some kind of fact or, you know. We, people respond to stories. Uh, it engages their midbrain, their emotional part of the brain. All right, a few more topics here I want to cover. Uh, I said that the old brain cares about really three things, food, sex, danger. So this is really going to sound very simplistic, and Eric will probably hate this because he kept saying, you know, he gave his presentation and he kept saying, and another big picture, and another big picture, right? Uh, well, <laughs> the pictures work. Depends on what it's a picture of. If it's a picture of food, that will gra grab the old brain's attention. If it's a picture of danger, that will grab the old brain's attention. If it's a picture of any kind of sexual content, and in fact, I can just kind of stand here and go like this. And, You're not listening to a word I'm saying, are you? Okay, we'll move on. Otherwise, I will never get your attention again. So the, the old brain, very, very interested in uh, uh, food, sex, danger. I get I get wonderful emails from people that have read my book, and um, it's probably one of the best things about having written that book is these great emails I get. And so, but some of them are a little funny. I got this one email from a, a man in the in the United States who said he has a um, a, a, a company that manufactures um, industrial cranes. You know the really big pieces of equipment that they use to, you know, people go up in them to work on buildings, you know. And he said, I, I read your book and I just loved it and we're trying and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna work on our website based on the stuff in your book. But I'm trying to he said we're really trying to figure out how we get the food and the sex and the danger all on the home page. <laughs> so I was thinking, he said, I you know, he's wanted my feedback. I'm thinking we put like an attractive woman and she's like standing there and she's got like a plate with a piece of cake on it. <laughs> and there's this big crane is about to fall on her head. And she has no idea. And he was serious. And I said, well, let's take it a little step at a time. You, know, you don't have to use everything I wrote about on every page. So maybe we could just have 
a testimonial about how wonderful the crane is. Let's just start there. Right. And I did check, and he didn't do it. So, so that's good. I thought we would uh, take a quick look at, at a couple of um, pages. I always like to just pull pages at random, and and together maybe we could think about you know what what uh, what this is the first one I pulled. Imagine that um, from a from an old brain and a mid brain and a new brain brain perspective. Uh, what do you think? What did they uh, did, did they do any of the things I've been saying to do? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. So we have a we have a picture, right? What would have been better to use as a picture? A woman, is that what someone said? <laughs> In a bikini holding the chocolate cake. Okay, no. Um, but it wouldn't, you know, people pictures are great, but to Eric's point, the pictures that are the most powerful are pictures of people. Uh, especially when you can, you know, their eyes are looking at you, that's the most powerful. Um, it does help if they are, you know, attractive, or if they are similar to you. That's another way to do it. They may not be movie star attractive, but they kind of look like me, so I feel like this is talking to me. Um, so they do have some faces of people, but guys, you're all scowling, kind of. <laughs> Luke has maybe a little bit of a smile on his face, so the rest of them. Now, um, and look at what, what else? There's something else on, on here that they did, another principle we talked about. Scarcity, we're sold out, right? We're sold out, ah. And I don't know if you know this, but, but before the we're sold out came up, there were actually, um, you know, it was like only silver tickets left, you know? Yeah, Bruno and the crew did a really good job on that. What about this one? UPA Usability Professional Association conference is in Munich, I think, coming up very soon. What do you think? Yeah, where's the story? There's a little picture over there, but it's so little, and the people are so far away, not particularly compelling, right? So nothing that's really speaking to the midbrain or the old brain. Here's another one. This is from my publisher, and I thought, <clears throat> you know, I guess they didn't read my book? No, they must have been. <laughs> What about this one? Again, from a midbrain and an old brain. Ah, there's some pictures. Those guys are smiling. They must be happier than the people who talk at this conference. I don't know. Um, they're smiling, but it's so small, right? The pictures are so small. And then there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of words. It's one of my favorites. United States government. <coughs> Really compelling, right? No. Uh, not very many pictures, you know, a lot of text. They also use blue and red together, which is such a great combination for usability purposes. So, I have a few words I want to say to wrap up, and, and uh, while I do that, before I do that though, um, this is the obligatory where you should go to find more information. But I actually want to say a few words about this. So one of the things I would, I would suggest you do is if you are designing a site or you have a site, or even if you don't, just pick any site and evaluate it in terms of some of these things that, that I've been talking about. Especially that mid-brain and that old brain, because you guys are designers, you'll, you'll have the new brain part. You got that down. You know what makes uh, a website usable from that performance and that conscious and copywriting point of view. But make sure you pay attention to that mid-brain and the old brain. Uh, company that I work for, Human Factors, we have a three-day class on this kind of topic. So if you really want to delve into it, that might be a good idea. Of course, I'm going to suggest that you read the book. Oh, and I do want to point out um, that the Spanish version, I don't know if we have anyone in here that is a Spanish speaker, but the Spanish version is available, and it has been launched. Um, they, have a big, they have a launch plan uh, next week, I believe. Um, and you can, there are links to where to go to get the Spanish version, etc. Uh, at my blog, which is there. And at my blog, I write a lot of articles about all of this. There's my Twitter, email. And I will be, uh, I do have put up on SlideShare, there is a five minute version. <laughs> it's really short, <clears throat> with audio, um, of kind of a version of this talk. So if you'd like to, to share it with other people. I want to leave you with uh, one of my favorite sayings from Socrates. 
the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have question time or not? No. No. Okay. No questions. But I'll be hanging around later if you have some. <laughs>